Now, let's turn to finding out how much useful work we can get out of an ideal gas. A machine that does this conversion is called a heat engine, as we said before. You'll notice I'm playing fast and loose with these terms heat and thermal energy and mechanical energy and useful work. The idea is that heat and thermal energy are often interchanged with each other. Mechanical energy and useful work are often interchanged. This is basically what our internal combustion engine does. It causes a gas, in this case a combusted hydrocarbon gas, to exert a force against a piston to push the piston inside a cylinder. The heat engine is engineered so that the piston is connected to a rod that turns a crankshaft that spins a transmission that twists the axles of your wheels. We're not going to worry about the engineering part just yet. We'll simply focus on the expanding gas in the cylinder. A typical automobile engine will have four cylinders, or six cylinders, or eight cylinders, each with their own pistons. The machine converts the heat energy of the exploding gas into useful mechanical work that can push the car down the road. That spinning crankshaft also runs the accessories of the car. The alternator, the air conditioner, the power steering system, all the electrical devices, etc. All these systems harvest energy from the exploding gas in the cylinders. So we want to examine one of these cylinders in detail. Our ideal device consists of a frictionless cylinder with a movable, massless piston that encloses an ideal gas. The bottom of the cylinder is closed, but its volume can vary by allowing the piston to move up and down. The cylinder has a radius r, as shown at the top, and let's assume that the piston starts at a distance x1 from the bottom of the cylinder. That's where the piston is in the low position. The volume v1 enclosed by this piston is given by the usual math equation for the volume of a cylinder. The volume is equal to pi r squared times the height x1. Now let's imagine the gas particles sealed in this volume between the bottom of the cylinder and the bottom of the piston, and these gas particles move randomly as gas particles tend to do with a variety of different speeds, colliding with the walls of the cylinder, occasionally colliding with each other, and colliding with the bottom of the piston. The gas particles are not permitted to leave the cylinder, and additional gas particles cannot enter, so the number of particles enclosed in this volume is fixed. This is important when it comes time to apply the gas ideal gas law, the piston is pushed upward by these colliding gas particles. Now let's suppose that there's a weight that's sitting on top of our massless piston. The Earth's gravity pulls the weight downward, balancing the particle's upward force on the piston, the weight holding the piston in equilibrium. Now let's suppose that we heat up the cylinder. Thermal energy flows through the walls of the container into the gas, transferring energy to the gas particles. Upon absorbing this energy, the gas particles begin moving faster, banging more frequently into the bottom of the piston and causing it to rise to a new height, x2. That's the position of this purple piston up here. All this happens in such a way, let's suppose, that the pressure in the container remains at a constant pressure we'll call P. Now the new volume that's enclosed by the piston is given by the same cylinder formula. V2 is equal to pi r squared times x2. There's been a change in the volume in the gas as a result of the heat entering the system and making the gas particles move faster. We want to derive an expression for how much useful work the gas does as a result of the heat entering the system. So, again, let's assume the pressure in the gas is constant, so that the energy transfer causes a gradual increase in volume, keeping everything in equilibrium until the new volume is reached. In actuality, these changes occur really quickly. In fact, as you drive your car down the road at about 60 miles an hour, there might be 20 to 30 explosions per second in each of the cylinders of your car engine. For our purposes, though, we're going to assume gradual changes so that the pressure remains constant throughout. So let's recall our definition of work. It's the constant force times the displacement the object is moved through, or the work is equal to the force times the distance. So the work that's done by the gas equals the force exerted by the gas times the distance through which the piston moves. Since the piston started at x1 and it ended at x2, the distance d that the piston moved is given by x2 minus x1. Now let's recall our definition of pressure. Pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. 
In this case, the area is the cross-sectional area of our piston, which is pi r squared. So the force that the gas exerts on the face of the piston is going to be given by the pressure times the area of the piston. F is equal to P times A, or A being pi r squared, F is equal to P times pi r squared. So now let's take this force and put it into our work equation. So the work done by the gas is the pressure times the area times the difference in the positions of the piston. Now, since pi r squared times x2 is the volume v2 and pi r squared times x1 is the volume v1, we can make a substitution into our work equation. We say that the work that's done by the gas is the pressure times the volume v2 minus the volume v1. Finally, and this is the important equation, the amount of work that's done by the gas on the piston and its surroundings is P times delta V, the constant pressure of the gas times the change in the volume of the gas resulting from the moving of the piston inside the cylinder. This is the important equation that you need to memorize that you're going to use in the problem solving. Now let me pause here to make a very important point. It's one that we've got to deal with constantly in thermodynamics. The work that's done by the gas on its surroundings is opposite in sign to the work that's done on the gas by the surroundings. Similarly, the amount of heat that flows into the gas from the surroundings is numerically equal to the negative of the amount of heat that flows out of the gas into the surroundings. When we talk about any of these variables, such as the work that's done by, W by, we mean what the gas is doing to its surroundings. On the other hand, when we discuss W on, we mean what the surroundings do to the gas. The distinction applies to what is the agent under examination. Is it the gas? Is it the surroundings? What agent is doing the work, or what agent is having the work done on it? The subscripts always apply to the gas itself. You should also note that on the AP exam, you'll have an equation sheet that will have some equations on it. But the equations won't have variables with subscripts. I am adding these subscripts. Your authors don't add them. I'm putting them in so that you can keep straight what's going on. Let's think about a concrete example. If a gas expands, it does positive work on its surroundings because the force the gas exerts on the piston and the displacement of the piston are in the same direction, making the resulting work a positive number. So let's suppose that you're solving an example problem and you find the work that's done by the gas is equal to positive 1,000 joules. Later on in the same problem, you'll run across the variable W on. What number are you going to use for that? Well, if you know that W by is equal to positive 1,000, then you can write that W on is equal to negative 1,000. Or let's suppose you're solving a problem and you find that the amount of heat that flows out of the gas is 2,000 joules. Later on in the problem, you may run across a situation in which you need actually the amount of heat that flows into the gas. You'll put a negative sign in front of that number in order to find the amount of heat that actually flows into the gas. In this case, you put a negative sign in front of the number 2,000 and you get negative 2,000 joules. Now, let's gear up to write down the first law of thermodynamics. The first law addresses changes in internal energy of any kind of object. To simplify things for this course, we confined our objects to ideal gases that are enclosed in a container. It's important to emphasize that the changes in internal energy can occur only if the system is not isolated. The system must be able to interact with its environment, giving up or absorbing heat, moving and doing work. The system is embedded in such a way that there can be an energy transfer between the system and its surroundings. There are two types of energy transfer that can happen between a system and its surroundings. What determines how we classify the nature of this energy transfer is not what happens in the system, but rather what happens in the surroundings. These two types of energy transfer are work and heat. The first kind of energy transfer is work. Work is an energy transfer between a system and its surroundings that result in organized motion in the surroundings. So, for example, I could increase the internal energy of water by stirring it. I could increase the internal energy of a block of wood by rubbing it vigorously, say with my hands. 
I could make the internal energy of a gas decrease by letting it push a piston outward in a cylinder. In each case, I'm causing an energy transfer between a gas and its surroundings that results from organized motions in the surroundings. Something is doing work on the surroundings, and the surroundings are pushed in a certain direction. On the other hand, the second type of energy transfer is heat. Heat is an energy transfer between a system and its surroundings that results in the random motions in the surroundings. Following the previous work examples, let's allow heat to be exchanged. I could cause the internal energy of a pot of water to increase by putting it on a hot plate, warming it up. I could increase the internal energy of a block of wood by setting it on fire. I could decrease the internal energy of a gas by allowing it to expand rapidly, say in the case of popping a balloon. In each of these examples, the energy transfers result in random motions in the surroundings, not in organized motions. So that's the difference between heat and work. Heat deals with random motions in the surroundings. Work deals with organized motions in the surroundings. And now we're prepared to write down the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is a statement of conservation of energy. When a system, a gas, exchanges energy with its surroundings, there are only two types of exchanges that can take place. They are heat processes and work processes. The principle of conservation of energy says that whatever occurs in the gas must result from these two processes. Either heat enters or leaves the gas, or work is done on or by the gas. So, in words, the first law of thermodynamics says this. Whenever changes in internal energy occur in a gas, result from heat flowing into the gas from the surroundings and work done on the gas by the surroundings. If you add these two quantities together, they will tell me numerically what the total changes in the internal energy of the gas are. Mathematically, in equation form, we'll write it this way. Delta U is equal to Q in 2 plus W on. This equation is a statement of the first law of thermodynamics, and this is the equation that you'll need to use in solving the problems. Note well, the signs will be very important, so we must keep up with what's happening with the energy in the system. Is energy entering the gas, or is energy leaving the gas? Now, let's pull together the important equations we've discussed in this lesson. We have six important equations. Delta U is 3 halves NR delta T for ideal gases. Work done by an ideal gas is pressure times the change in volume. The work done on the gas is equal to the negative of the work that's done by the gas. The heat flowing into a gas is equal to the negative of the heat flowing out of the gas. The change in internal energy is equal to the heat flowing into the gas plus the work that's done on the gas and the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. These are the tools that you should have in your thermodynamics toolbox. So now, at long last, let's apply what we know, what we've learned 